Any of y'all wants to help fund my children's moments? <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> Wait till next service? Okay. The whole choir will be sitting down here in children's <laughs> moment in next service. There you go. Because you're all children of God, right? There you go. There you go. No, I, I, I love to reward our children in church. And, um, you know, now they can take that and spend it how they wish. Uh, and, and know that living for God comes with reward it's not always financial reward as a matter of fact most of the times it's not financial reward but the bible has promises there for uh good financial stewardship you know he told us in matthew i mean malachi 3 10 through 12 bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse and prove me therein if i won't open the windows of heaven over you and pour out blessings upon you that you cannot contain and i will rebuke the devourer for your sake have you ever had those seasons in life you thought, I must have a hole in my pocket because all my money just keeps disappearing? <laughs> or, or, or you think, well, doggone it. Every time I get a little money saved, something happens and poof, it's all gone. And sometimes the devourer is just working in our lives, stealing away the blessings God has given us. And we need to be aware of that. Just slap his hand, rebuke him in Jesus' name. But I also like a passage it's luke 6 either 37 or 38 i think it's 38 given it shall be given unto you pressed down shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom i learned years ago that you cannot outgive god and it doesn't matter how you try to outgive god god has more to give than you do but we are blessed to be an avenue through which god works in the community and in the world and i want to be an avenue through which god pours so that means I must submit my heart, my mind, my wills, my desires to God's heart, mind, wills, will, and desires so that I don't try to hold on to anything that he's trying to pour through me. He didn't. What happens when the water in the pond ceases to be poured in and then poured out? It dries up or it becomes full of nasty you ever seen a pond full of nasty it had enough water to keep it going but it didn't have a flow of water going in and going out to keep it living or life-giving you know you don't want to go get a drink out of that pond but you know where that living water flows the blessing of god is you can go get a drink out of that one and it's great keep our <laughs> our youth leaders in your prayers our youth are on their annual fall camp out at Buck's Pocket, and we're thankful today we are not there. <laughs> God bless them, and that they might have a great time there building relationship and learning more about the Lord and, and all of that. I know they look forward to it every year, and it seems like every time they go, it's bad weather. It just never fails. It just kind of works out that way. So we will be in prayer for them. They get home safely uh, today, and, and they've had a great time in the Lord. Often when I pray for the church, I, I pray, and especially if I'm praying out loud with a pastoral prayer or something like that, I will pray that God will lead us into the full potential that he has for us in Christ Jesus. Full potential as an individual member of the body of Christ, but also the full potential that our church can lean into and live into as a church in the community, in the world, and in the kingdom of God. And when we read the first 11 verses of John 15, and Jesus gives us this parable of the vine, he's really helping us better understand in a very simple way how to really live into our full potential, live into a place of fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. And we want to look at that again this morning. And I have three words that I want you to remember. I had three words last Sunday morning I wanted you to remember. I have three words this Sunday morning I want you to remember. And all of these starts with a C. And the first one is cleansing or clean. The second one is connected. And the third one is compliant. Compliant. So we're going to read John 15, 1 through 11, English Standard Version. 
And we're going to look at this parable in three sections and hear what Jesus would speak to us this morning as his disciples here November 12th, 2023. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. So let us begin with the word clean. Just say together with me this morning, I am clean in Christ. I am clean in Christ. Aren't you thankful for that day that you humbled your heart before God, made your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and you experienced a cleansing of your sin, a freshness that you had not known before that moment in time? A new beginning, a new birthday, spiritually speaking, for your life. I remember that very, very clearly when I gave my heart to Jesus at 14 years of age. I I got up out of that altar after I'd made my profession of faith in Jesus Christ and I immediately sensed a change in my life, a freshness, a newness, and if you will, a cleansing of my life. And it was wonderfully wonderfully refreshing. I had the opportunity, and I've shared with this, this with you in the past, of leading a, a lady who was probably about 40 years old at the time in a profession of faith. She was seated in her wheelchair, and she had been in the hospital for a little over a year. Well, she stayed in the hospital a little over a year. About this time, uh, she had, I had known her for about four or five months, and all of that time I had known her as a patient in the hospital. But I went to her room one day to to visit with her, and and she was sitting there in the doorway in her wheelchair. And I said, what are you doing, Melanie? And she said, well, I'm just sitting here thinking about you. And I said, well, was it good or bad? And she just smiled, and she said, well, I'm thinking about you and the people at the church where you pastor. And I said, well, what about us were you thinking? And she said, I want to be like you people one day. And I said, Melanie, you don't have to wait until one day You can be that person right now if you want to. We've talked about this several times. And I said, do you want to be that person today? And she said, yes. So I knelt beside her wheelchair and I led her in a a, a confession of sin and a a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And we got finished praying. I said, amen. She said, amen. And, And I just kind of looked up at her. I was still kind of squatted down in the floor leading her in that prayer. And And I was looking up at her, and she opened her eyes, and she looked up, and she said, Wow, how refreshing. And I thought, isn't that so true? That that when God comes to live in our hearts and lives, when Jesus comes, when Holy Spirit comes, it's such a refreshing, cleansing moment in life, and we all get to share in that joy as members of the body of Christ. Well, Jesus tells us here in the... The first three verses, I'm the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Now hear what Jesus says in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now there's a lot of debate about the Greek word, iro, 
and the translation of that word into English. Let me share with you what has been translated into takes away. The first definition of Iro in the Greek is lifts up from the ground. The second definition of Iro is takes upon oneself and carries what is lifted up. And the third one is simply carry off. Now a lot of times we've looked at this passage in John chapter 15 verse number 2 and it says every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. Rip! Throws it away. No good. No thank you. No patience for you. Does that sound like Jesus to you? No. No it does not, does it? Jesus first encourages the branch that is not bearing any fruit. As a matter of fact, Jesus even lifts up the branch that is not bearing fruit. If you know very much about a vineyard and a grapevine, sometimes those vines grow out and they grow along the ground. And you know as well as I do, you're not going to have a fruitful branch of the vine if it's growing across the ground. So what does the keeper of the vineyard do? He picks it up and he wraps it around the trellis to hold it up and give it an opportunity to get the sunshine and get rid of all of the dirt and become fruitful. Aren't you glad today when you were dirty in sin that God picked you up and wrapped you up in the kingdom of God to give you an opportunity to become fruitful for his kingdom? We've all got to start somewhere, and we all started in the same place. And that was at the foot of the cross, asking for forgiveness of our sins, for cleansing and newness of life in Him. So when I think about this passage, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. I, I think about Jesus lifting that branch up. A as a matter of fact, takes upon oneself and carries. I'm thankful for the days and the seasons when God was willing to carry me when I couldn't carry myself. You ever seen that footprints in the sand? Picture and poem? How that, oh, for so long I, I walked beside Jesus and there were two footprints in the sand. And, and, and then I saw when they were only one set. And then I saw two set again. And we said, Jesus, why was it in my greatest struggle that you left me alone there? I see only one set of footprints in the sand. And he said, oh, 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 my child, I didn't leave you. That's the season I carried you. How good our God is. In and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So know this morning that Jesus is ready to do what Jesus needs to do in our hearts and lives to clean us up and to lift us up, to give us an opportunity to be fruitful. He goes on to say, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Have you ever gone through a pruning in life? God took some things away that weren't sinful. God just said, you need to lay this aside. You need to go forward without this so that you can be more fruitful in the kingdom of God. Sometimes less is more. Did you know that? Sometimes when God takes some things out of our life, we've then got more attention, more focus, more time, more resources to pour into those things that are more important in life and more important especially in the kingdom of God. But then listen to what he says in verse number 3. This is really what gives me my thoughts about the interpretation of verse number 2. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the eleven. Because Judas has already left to betray him in John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, after he washed the disciples' feet, he said, you are all clean except one of you. And then Judas left to do what Judas would do. And here he says what? Already you are clean. Speaking to every one of them. So every one of them, he's saying, look, my God, my Father is going to work in your heart and life to lift you up and give you the sunshine 
of His Spirit and His love that you might grow in the kingdom of God and become fruitful. And when you become fruitful, He's going to prune in your heart and life that you might bear more fruit and know that you are clean because of the Word I have spoken to you. And I'll tell you, the Word of God is the best cleaning agent we will find for our spirit and our soul on the face of the earth. Everybody has their own favorite washing powders or washing detergent. We like Tide. Tide with Downy because it gives it a little smell and a little softness. Tide. What do y'all use? Susan, what, what do you use, Susan? Oh, free and clear. Anybody else? Whatever's on sale. <laughs> But none of that can touch the cleansing power of the Word of God. Amen? It cleanses our soul of those stains and that filth that does not any longer need to be a part of the person in the life we live. As a matter of fact, when Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, he said in Ephesians 5, 25 and following, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We could preach on that for a few hours. And gave himself up for her. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. So God is working in and through our lives by the word of God to cleanse us that we might be fruitful in the kingdom of God. So God has done his part. Say that with me. God has done his part. Thanks be to God. So that's clean. God has provided a cleansing for us in Christ Jesus. But God has also provided us an avenue of connection in and through faith in Jesus Christ. Connection brings about union. And union brings about or leads to communion have you ever noticed the word communion ends with the word union god connects himself to us in spirit that he might have communion with us fellowship with us sharing with us because god wants to share his spirit his life his divine nature with us so that we might have spiritual fruit in our life and that it might in turn bring about more fruit in the kingdom of god more souls one to the kingdom because why are we here we're here to win the lost and disciple the found amen and we've got to win the lost to be able to disciple the found and god wants to work in and through our lives that lost people might see the christ in us and the lives we live and want that same life for themselves so he provides an opportunity for connection let me share with you first corinthians six seventeen. I want you to memorize this one if you haven't. It's one of those I've hidden in my heart. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He that is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That's that spiritual connection we have with God through faith in Jesus Christ. When we are born again, God's Holy Spirit comes to live within us and again connects Holy Spirit self to our spirit that's how we have eternal life and through that connection comes that communion that sharing in second peter chapter uh one verse number four peter talks about through the great and precious promises of god we have become partakers of god's divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world we escape the corruption that's in the world. That's the cleansing of God in our hearts and lives. But because of the promises of God, we've been connected to God, and now we share in the divine nature of God. How many times has something happened in your life and somebody said, wow, listen at you, and you said, oh, that wasn't me, that was God. If you ever hear me preach a good sermon, you go, oh, that wasn't Pastor Ricky, that was God. Working in and through because we've made a divine connection with God. And, and Jesus tells us, abide in me and I in you. Now, he'll always be faithful to his part, the I in you. But we need to make sure about the first part. He says, abide in me. He's talking to us. We need to get our hearts and our minds in line with the things of God and the kingdom of God. 
We need to be heavenly minded while we're still on earth, but not so heavenly minded we're no good on earth. Amen? We need to be seeking the things of the kingdom of God, not building our own. A lot of folks on the face of the earth are trying to build their own kingdom. But Jesus said, I want you to be a built kingdom builder in my kingdom. Something that has eternal significance and eternal reward. He said, abide in me and I in you. He said, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. You might look around at your life and say, God, I don't see a whole lot of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Well, maybe we need to do a better job about abiding. Maybe you've got a 10 or 15 or 30 minute devotion in the morning. But do you carry that spirit of devotion with you throughout the rest of the day? So that your whole day is given to God in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we're not seeing the fruit, it's not God's fault. We might need to take a look at our own lives because he tells us whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I know good and well, I know you folks, you would never try to do something without God's help. Would you? Yes, we would. And that's where we get in trouble. Because Jesus made it simple and plain and clear. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Why do we try? Sometimes we just can't help ourselves. And then we fall flat on our face and go, Dad, gone it. I knew I shouldn't have done this without praying about it first. You're right. You shouldn't. I shouldn't have done it without praying about it first because we want to keep God woven into everything we do as we abide in Him and He abides in us so that we can be fruitful knowing that apart from Him we can do nothing. But now listen to this one. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. That is no magic formula. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you abide in Christ and God's word abides in you, whatever you wish will be completely in line with the will of God. So don't ask something out of the will of God or just because you want it. If you're abiding in Christ and his word's abiding in you and Holy Spirit floats up something you need to pray for and pray about, get to praying. Because Jesus said it's going to be done. In that you will be fruitful and my Father will be glorified. Because when God answers that prayer, and it's above and beyond anything you can think, do, or imagine, all you can do is say, God did it. I prayed for it. God did it. Praise the Lord. Amen? God gives us ample opportunity to praise the Lord in and through our prayer life because he wants us to be fruitful in our prayer life. So, we've got to be clean. We are clean in Jesus Christ. We've got to be connected. Got to be connected. God has connected us to Jesus Christ. But then, compliant. When I say that word, does it sound negative to you? It did to me. And I thought, I'm not going to use that word. Holy Spirit, give me another one. And he wouldn't. He said, no, stick with compliant. So I, I looked it up. I, I googled it for a definition. Compliant. Now listen to the Oxford language's definition of the word compliant. Inclined to agree with others or obey rules, especially to an excessive degree. I mean, I'm going to obey the rules to the little bitty things in life. And the great big things in life and everywhere in between. Matter of fact, I am going to be excessively obedient. Does God bless obedience? Oh, you can count on it. Why does God want us to be compliant? He said in verse number 9, let me read 9, 10, and 11 again. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Well, okay, Jesus, how do I abide in your love? He tells us in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's how we abide in his love, by keeping his commandments. In John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Jesus wants us to abide in the Father's love, and we abide in his love by keeping the commandments. Why is that? Because if I'm living a life according to God's word, I'm living a life that God can bless. Don't sin or don't live independently of God and ask God to bless your life. It's not going to happen. But live according to the word of God in the power of the spirit of God and watch and see if the blessing of God will not rain down on your life. I'm starting to preach like a Baptist. Is that okay? 
I used to be one. I'm just a Christian now. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things that I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Are you full of the joy of the Lord today? He has made provision for us. He's cleansed us. He's connected to us. He's lifted us up to bask in the sunshine of his presence and his love. That as he pours his spirit into us and through us, we might bear fruit. We might have a fruitful prayer life. We might live in the fruit of God's love. And right here, we might live in the fruit of God's joy. I want to tell you what. If the church lived in the joy of the Lord, like the church should live in the joy of the Lord, it would turn the community and the world upside down. Because too many times we look as frowned up and pruned up as the world does. And the joy of the Lord is not our strength. But God wants the joy of the Lord to be our strength. And he's made provision for that to happen. Church, may we submit ourselves to the cleansing power of God. Church, may we be connected to God that we might abide in him and have both union and communion with him. May we be compliant, obedient in the smallest of things that we might remain in his love and having done all these things may we be filled with the joy of the lord forevermore amen amen